Good morning, everybody. I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce Gary Schmidt, the award-winning author of many remarkable novels for young readers, including his most recent, The Surpassingly Brilliant OK for Now. In a Darwinian twist that doesn't seem quite fair, Gary is also one of the most wonderful people on earth. <laughs> and hands down personal favorite of the HMH staffers who are lucky enough to work with him in both Boston and New York. In addition to being an amazing writer, Gary is a distinguished and beloved English professor at Calvin College in Michigan. We look forward to seeing him each January when he escorts a bus full of really, really lucky students from Grand Rapids to Boston to visit our many literary landmarks. I don't know about you, but I could hardly get 10 minutes of office time with my English professors when I was in college, but maybe it says more about me, but it says a lot about Gary. <laughs> Despite a truly intimidating schedule this week, Gary has kindly agreed to save some time for us today to talk about the creative process of writing for children and or whatever else is on his mind. So without further ado, here's Gary Schmidt. Good morning, folks. This is where you say good morning. <laughs> I am indeed with about 27 college students. I have two other professors who are with me. We began by doing a live-in over to Plymouth, in which I spent a night on the floor in a, one of those reconstructed houses. The fact that I'm still standing is pretty cool, actually. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. And this is not a story that you expected to hear this morning which makes it all the better. And I'll show you why, when we get to the end of it, why I'm going to tell it to you now. It's an Old Testament story, and you all know it, I suspect. And it's the story of a guy named Elisha and Naaman. Naaman is the general Petraeus of his age. He is absolutely dominant, wealthy, powerful, amazingly important. His job is to stand by the king, the king of Aram, when the king kneels down to whatever idol in the Rimon, he in fact kneels with him. When the king wants to stand, he stands with him. That's his job. In addition to commanding all the armies, he is exactly what everyone here would like to be. Well-known, easy, familiar, and right in the center of things. Until the day comes when he wakes up and finds that he has leprosy. And everything's gone. Every single thing that he owns and is is gone. In despair, he looks around for some help. He gets none until he finally comes back home and asks the advice of his wife's young girl slave. In other words, in this culture, there is nowhere else to go. He's asking the advice of a slave, a child, a girl. There is nowhere else to go. And she says to him, I think that there's a prophet out to Israel. Why don't you go see him? This is not the advice he wants, but there is nothing left to lose. And so he goes to his king, and he gathers together a treasure. And he says to his king, this is what I'm going to do. This is why. And the king of Aram senses opportunity. This is his guy, his second-hand man, and he's got leprosy. He's a dead man. No more to build on there, but you might be able to still use him. You might be able to provoke a quarrel and use that quarrel. And so he says to him, go ahead, and he sends a note with him, and the note says to the king of Israel, I'm sending you this my servant, Naaman, so that you can heal him. And when the king of Israel gets that note, he realizes this is a game because he will not heal him. There's no way it's going to happen. And when Naaman dies, then the king of Israel will be to blame. And there will be war, and Israel will be destroyed. <laughs> Naaman also realizes something. Once that letter is read, he realizes that he who was the general Petraeus of his age is now a pawn. That's it. He is a pawn in a geopolitical game, and nothing will be built there. However, as he's about to despair, he hears of Elisha and is sent then to Elisha. In fact, Elisha says, come and see me, and then you will know 
his line is. And then you will know. Not you will be healed. You will know. And so he goes. And when he gets there, he knocks on the door, and Elijah doesn't show. He sends a servant, and he says to him, Naaman, there's that filthy, awful river. Go there, if you would, and throw yourself in seven times. And Naaman is ticked. He's angry. First off, it's a servant that's been sent. And second, it's a dirty river. And he has finally come to the point where he says, okay, I'll die. But I'm not going to be treated this way. I won't. And he turns around and goes away, except he stops one more time. Because another servant, it's amazing how many powerless people there are in this story. Another servant says to him, Naaman, what do you got to lose? If you go home, you die. And Naaman recognizes, you're right. And so, humiliated, he keeps all of his servants, everyone, back up by the house, and by himself, he goes down to the water and throws himself in. If it was us, we would go down alone too. He throws himself in seven times. And when he comes up the seventh time, he is stunned because everything he had thought about himself, his power, his wealth, it's all gone, but he has another knowing. He goes up to Elijah because he's now healed. His skin, we're told, is the skin of a young boy. He says to Elijah, who finally comes out, thank you very much, wow, I want to give you all this wealth I've brought. And Elijah says, no, not interested. He says, I have it all. And he says, no. I'm not interested. And so Naaman heads out, except he turns back one more time. And this is why I'm telling you this story, the strangest story in any religious tradition that I've ever read. Naaman says to him, Elijah, I have this job. I go to the temple of Rimnon, and I rise with the king, and I kneel with the king when he worships. I know that that's just an idol. I know. And I know that God is God now. I know but I got this job. What should I do? Now, this is Elijah. This is the Old Testament prophet, the robe, the beard, the staff, you know, all the things going on. What should Elijah say to him? It should be, what a jerk you are. He should slap him across the face. He should say, go home and die, idiot. Little pieces of you will fall off as you go back home in your chariot. When you get home, no one will want to say anything to you because you'll be so awful. Go home and die. What a jerk. But this is what he says. He goes, go home in peace. That's the advice. And he goes home. And that little moment, that pause between what should I do and go home in peace, that moment, that is where the writer dwells. It is that moment that the writer dwells. That moment of ambiguity. What should happen? How do I deal with the complexity of this world? What kinds of things should I use to base my decisions on? How do I decide what is the good? How do I decide what is the bad? How do I decide at all? That tiny moment, that is where the writer lives. That one moment of ambiguity. That is where it all happens. Periodically, you folks send me letters from various students. Let me read you just a couple. Hello, Caitlin Jones here. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you very much. I personally have always wanted to meet a true author. I thought you did a good job on First Boy. I'm not sure my book is even that good. When I grow up, I want to be a book writer since I already have 27 pages wrote by hand. I was wondering if I sent my book to you would you be able to look it over without taking any ideas? <laughs> Not to be mean about the idea thing, but I don't really know you. Isn't she great? If, I, if you could please write back and tell me, you could edit and read my book, my address is, and then she gives it to me. She never sent it. Dear Mr. Gary Schmidt, I thought your first book was good. I heard you were going to rewriting a second. I jumped out of my seat. I was wondering if I could have your second book for free. 
So this is your next publicity person. I know what you're thinking. Why should I give a free book to a kid who has no money? Well, I'd be happy to spread your name so you will make more money. <laughs> is this your publicity department right here? Dear Mr. Schmidt, honestly, I didn't enjoy Wednesday Wars all that much. <laughs> I recently read it from my eighth grade summer reading book. It was decent, not at the top of my list. <laughs> One thing I didn't love about the book was the humor. I'm going into eighth grade. Let me tell you, eighth graders' sense of humor is on a completely different planet. Toads, beetles, bats slide in you and the red plague rid you. We don't talk like that. <laughs> this is a great kid. <laughs> and so here's the, the bottom paragraph. You won the Newbery Honor, so obviously your book was well liked. <laughs> Overall, I think it was mediocre. <laughs> In my opinion, there were some very well written parts that I admired, but now here's my favorite sentence. Then there were the childish parts, he's an eighth grader, which weren't to my fancy. <laughs> Is that fantastic? Has anyone in this room in the recent years said to my fancy? <laughs> but this is from Tommy. Mr. Schmidt, I really liked your book. I liked the character who was Danny Hupfer. He was brave and courageous. I wish I could be like Danny Hupfer. I'd work a long time for that letter. I wish I could be like Danny Hupfer. Or this one. My name is James. I'm in the eighth grade. For our class, we had to read a book with more than 150 pages. <laughs> when I opened your book and read the inside cover, I thought I'd hate it. The first page really drew me in with, to the book with a simile. The rest of the pages just kept me reading. The fact that Cooper's grandfather died helped me to relate to Cooper. When I was five years old, my mother came into my room at 10 o'clock, bawling. She mustered up the courage to tell me my grandfather had died, the same grandfather I had shared apricot pinwheels with less than eight hours before. This kid's a writer. When I found out Cooper's grandfather had died, I had to set the book down. I let it sit on the coffee table for two days before I tried to pick it up again. I was able to keep reading all the way through the book. I have to say I liked it, though I'm not much of a reader. I enjoyed reading your book. It helped me realize that all things have to leave us one time or another. All things have to leave us one time or another. The writing of books is a serious task in America today, in a culture which often isn't very serious. Writing for kids, I think, is particularly serious, a serious business. My own interest in writing is this. I have one question. I'm a sort of one-note kind of guy. And it's this. What is it in our culture, how is it in our culture, that a kid can turn his face from childhood to adulthood? How does that happen? What kinds of things must occur to a child in order to help, help that child say, I'm going to think of myself as an adult, or I'm going to at least turn my face towards adulthood? How does that happen? Because we live right now, folks, in a culture that wants that not to happen. We all know that. We live in a culture where it's desirable for everyone to stay as an adolescent and live as an adolescent. In that culture, how do we get a kiddo to turn his or her face towards adulthood? I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by that question. And Lizzie Bright and the Buckminster, this is a book that began when I discovered the story of an island that was destroyed, an island community that was destroyed. There's a kiddo, Turner, who is about to come upon this for the very first time. He looks out across from this landscape and sees an island out there that is mostly populated by Irish American and African American folks, based on a 1912 true story. That island is standing in the way of development. And the decision is made by the town to destroy the community there in order to create a place that is pristine, beautiful, perfect. In order to create a Maine that is called vacation land. If we went a little north of here and found a Maine car, the license plate, the bottom would say, vacation land. That was a decision that was made. It didn't just happen. And it was made about 100 years ago, this year actually. Turner finds this island about to be destroyed. He has to decide in the story, what do I do with that? What happens when a kid today decides that he wants to go against our culture? How does that happen? He decides, in fact, that he is going to try and stop that. It is a naive decision. He can't possibly do it. 
He has a house, actually inherits a house in the town. He wants to give it to a family that's part of this, but that won't happen either. But in those decisions, in deciding to stand against the tide of the culture, Turner is turning his face towards adulthood, which, by the way, is why his name is that. In Wednesday Wars, there's a kiddo named Holland. When I was in seventh grade in my school on Long Island, at 1.30 on Wednesdays, every kid in my class who was Jewish got up and left to go to Hebrew school. Every kid who was Catholic got up 10 minutes later and they went to catechism. That left only me in that room, no kidding. I was the entire Protestant Reformation all by myself <laughs> standing in that classroom and there was Mrs. Baker at her desk and there was me on my desk and I looked across and I knew with absolute certainty that Mrs. Baker hated my guts. <laughs> Which wasn't all that bad because I kind of hated hers. But she, when she looked at me, what she saw was, I'm not going to be off for two hours every Wednesday. I got to do something with this jerk. <laughs> so what she did was to make me into a janitor. And I spent most of my first Wednesdays cleaning the classroom for two hours after all my friends had left. How delightful was that? We had rats. I cleaned out the rat cages. We had a cloak room, not a coat room and not lockers. It was a cloak room. Wow, that's sort of dating me. A cloak room. I would clean that out. People would have thrown liverwurst sandwiches, egg salad sandwiches in that cloak room a week ago. Do you know what liverwurst is like a week after being in a hot cloak room? I would then sweep, I'd do the windows, vinegar, I'd do the chalkboards, go out and do, remember this? Going out and doing the erasers? Kids have no idea when I do this, they have no idea what that is. I would do all that. On the very first day, when I finished, I went up to Mrs. Baker's desk and I said, done. And she said, really? And I said, yes. And she said, huh. And she pulled out her top desk drawer. From out her top desk drawer, she took out a razor blade. And with one finger, she slid the razor blade across the desk to me. I picked it up. I had no idea what to do with it. I figured she wants me to go back into the cloakroom and commit suicide. <laughs> and then I'm done, or she's done. But she didn't want me to do that. Those of you my age or so, will remember that in school there used to be no rules against chewing gum. And now you know the whole story. I was to go around and cut off or scratch off the gum that everyone had been putting under their chairs and under their desks. When my friends found out that I was doing that, do you think they A, stopped putting gum under their chairs and desk, or B, yeah, layered it on and in fact, that's what it was. And I was underneath Ernie Hupper's desk one day, one Wednesday, getting off all the gum that he had scraped and put into the screw holes. As Mr. Jeanette, the principal, walked in, Mr. Jeanette was wearing a 16-piece suit. <laughs> he looked at Mrs. Baker and said, what is he doing? He didn't know my name. What is he doing? And Mrs. Baker said, well, he's all by himself. It's not like I can teach him or anything. Yes, one of those lines that sticks in your soul, <laughs> which I will accuse her of someday. It's not like I can teach him or anything. And Mr. Jeanette said, you have to do something educational. And Mrs. Baker said, he's all by himself. And thus an argument ensued, which ended with Mr. Jeanette yelling at Mrs. Baker. Folks, it was the best three minutes of my life. <laughs> to watch Mrs. Baker get yelled, watch your teacher get yelled at by your principal, it was <coughs> ecstasy. But it ended. And he walked out, and he closed the door. And Mrs. Baker looks at me, and I'm thinking, homicide. She wants to kill me. The only thing standing between us is my, you know, my razor blade. <laughs> However, if you had been there, oh my. What, you, what happened next, you would have thought it was wicked cool. Because I walked up to the desk, and with one finger, I pushed the razor the blade back to her. It was really cool. <laughs> she took it and put it away. I went back to my desk, having just won this exchange. But Mrs. Baker, who was nefarious and evil, had more to play. 
And she pulled out her desk drawer, and she pulled out a large green volume, snot green, and it was this heavy, weighty tome. And she brought it to my desk, and she sat on, put it on the desk, and said, read this. And I opened it, the play of Macbeth. It was the plays of William Shakespeare. For all of seventh grade, two hours every Wednesday, I read the plays of William Shakespeare. That's all I did. We never talked about it. We never discussed it. We never tested on it. She never asked me which play I was on. She wasn't interested. OK. I never told her what I would not tell her now if she walked in that door, and it was this, that I loved it. I loved it. I read just for story. If I didn't know a word, I blew it off. If I didn't like a character, turn the page. A scene I couldn't get, those clowns, I just blew them off. I read just for story. And if you think about plays like Macbeth and all the blood and all the gore, and then you think of a seventh grade boy, that'll do. The stories were amazing. They were powerful for me. So the day came when I wanted to write a story that I wanted to make as a comedy. I wanted it to be a kind of Shakespearean comedy. It seemed to me that I could find this, this what I've just told you, find its way into a novel, but make Mrs. Baker a good person instead of the evil person that she was. <coughs> and so enter Holling Hood Hood, who is this kiddo who, much like me, is, finds himself exactly in the situation of being alone in a classroom, who has to decide, how am I going to deal with this odd teacher, and whose life has been shaped, or is being shaped, by a family that is pretty busy and doesn't particularly care about him, and also by a, a society which is being torn apart. It's set in 67, 68. In 1968, colleges are being shut down. Columbia University is shut down here. There are 100,000 people on the mall in Washington, D.C. every weekend. The New York Times is running the names of those boys shot and killed in Vietnam on Saturday. There are 250 names, guys, a week, every week. Martin Luther King is shot and killed in the spring of 1968. On the day that his assassin is discovered, on that day, Bobby Kennedy is shot and killed, and the president who could have brought us out of it is gone. The person who could have brought us out of it is gone. I wanted to write about a time when our nation was struggling, and a time when a junior high kid is in that struggle, when his nation is at war, which is, of course, right now. The only difference being the draft. Holling has to decide, how am I going to be an adult? And the decision comes at the end of the novel when he begins to recognize that he has to make calls. He can't let his parents define him. He can't let his peers define him. He can't let Mrs. Baker define him. He has to make decisions. And that truly is a sign of adulthood when we begin to say, I decide, not others. I decide, and I bear the consequences for that. OK, for now. The latest novel started in Flint, Michigan, which is our most violent city in America, about two hours away from it. It's a city that has no resources, that is now the mayor has been replaced by an accountant because the disaster of the budget is so profound. In the midst of that, in the midst of this violence, there is one small island that stays open late at night so that people have a safe place to go. It's the public library. And they have no resources, but they have librarians who love books, who love what you guys do, and who live for that, and who help others to live for that. In the midst of that, during a gig, I wandered around through a building that was struggling. And I came upon a small, not a small, a large glass case. And I looked into it. And in that case is a book, a huge book, John James Audubon's Birds of America. It's not a first which is actually a first is being auctioned off as we sit here right now. I put in a bid, but I just don't let go. It's not a first, but it's an early one. It's probably worth half a million dollars. And I asked them, why don't you sell this? Half a million dollars. I mean, think of the resources. Think what you could do with a half a million dollars. And they said, no. If, I sell, if we sell it, then it won't be here for future generations. That's nobility. On the way home, I heard about, on NPR, I heard about a school, a junior high in Pennsylvania that had received in the 1930s a mural by N.C. Wyeth. No kidding, N.C. Wyeth. 
a mural for their auditorium, a huge mural like that. They had to decide, should we keep this million dollar painting or should we sell it? What should we do? Well, if they sold it, then this incredible painting that had been gracing that hall and that these kids had seen for generations would be gone. But if they sold it, they'd have a million dollars and they have another teacher just off the endowment alone. What to do? And they sold it. The story of OK for now is that story. A kid who's beat up, a kid who is in an abusive family, who is desperately struggling for just one thing, the one thing he wants, one thing that's whole, one thing that's perfect in his life, just one dang thing. And he comes upon the small library that has an Audubon, and the pages are being sold off, which is how Audubons are destroyed, because the books are more valuable if you rip out each of the pages and sell them separately than if you sell the whole book, unbelievably. Nine pages are missing, and Doug resolves that he is going to try and figure out how to get all nine of them back so that he will create one whole thing. The question of the book is this. How do we look for wholeness? What does that even mean? To be a whole person. And in that search, Doug turns his face towards adulthood. The next book that will come out with you folks in, an, in I don't know, the end of the year, I guess, is called What Came From the Stars. It is my first fantasy. It started, alas, I don't know if I told you this, Dinah, on a bet, really. Um, there's a writer, Ann Ursu, who has a wonderful novel out this year called Breadcrumbs. And she writes these long, honking, you know, fantasies that have a thousand names in them with big quests and the guy with a beard and swords. You know, no matter how high tech, it's always swords. You know, that sort of fantasy stuff. And I love to give her a hard time about fantasy. Oh, you get in trouble, so you just whip up some magic. Boy, that's really hard. And finally she said to me, well, you do one. And I said, why not? Why not? And it's a story about a kiddo who is amazingly able to find a necklace which gives him access to a different world whose culture is being destroyed. This kid is himself hurt because his last words to his mother before she roars off in the car in anger are abusive. And when she roars off in anger, she gets is in an accident. And he knows that the last thing he said to his mother was crappy. And he knows that her anger came about because of him. And he knows that the accident came about because of her anger. How to forgive himself? How does he even know how to forgive himself? As he learns through the course of this book, I hope, as he learns that he is not able always to control the world and that we have to live with our own smallness and our own mortality, he finally comes to the point where he begins to think, I can forgive myself which is what the book is about, at least for me. That's my question. What happens in our lives that enables us to move towards adulthood? And that's what I write about. Three quick stories for you. How do these books go out into the world? I am in Detroit. I talk to a group of about, I don't know, 150 eighth graders. At the end of this, a young girl comes up to me and she begins to talk to me about what she's writing. It's fantastic. She has all these pages. She has all these stories going. And as we're talking, she is getting more and more animated until three guys come up and stand right next to her. And they're up. They're excited. They're out of class. They're excited. As soon as they stand there, bang, that girl is silenced. She speaks nothing. In fact, she begins to look down at her feet, and she moves back. These three guys go on, talk about really nothing. And when they le leave, finally, this young girl, she looks up again. And she looks at me, and bang, she's right there again. How often is that girl silenced? Another time, I am north, I'm northern Michigan in a small town named Houghton Lake. I'm tired. I have a bazillion papers to grade, more than a bazillion, many more than a bazillion. <laughs> I've been teaching all day. It's April, which means that as I drive up in northern Michigan, it's snowing and there's ice everywhere. When I get far, far up there, 
I finally, finally find the hotel. I have all this work to do, and the librarians are going to meet me for supper. I don't want to go to supper. I just want to get these dumb papers graded or at least started and then fall asleep so I can be ready for the gig the next day. But they want a supper, and so I go. And it's fine. And at the end of it, one of the librarians says to me, we have this reading group for reluctant readers. They're reading one of your books, Trouble. Would you like to come and be a part of their discussion? This is what librarians do. And in my heart, I'm saying, no, I really, really don't want to come. I'm tired. I have a bazillion papers. You know, it was a lousy drive up here. I have a long day. I really don't want to come. And of course, what I said to them was, oh, I'd love to. <laughs> so we get in the car. We start driving out of Houghton Lake. And it very quickly gets dark. And there's no lights anywhere. And there's a dirt road that they take a ride on to. And there's nothing nowhere. And I think, isn't there a Stephen King novel like this? <laughs> and isn't it a bad ending in that novel? When there are finally lights off to the right, it turns out to be an asphalt building with two bright lights on it. There are no windows. There are no windows. And we drive in. There's no sign. We get out the car. We go up to the door. It's a steel door. There is nothing there. And a buzzer. She rings a buzzer. And another buzzer comes up. And the door opens. We walk in. There's another steel door, this one with a small window. And there is a prison guard. This is a medium security prison for young boys. By the time we get to the third door, I have seen only one kiddo, however. It's a kid whose head is being held into a garbage pail, and he is throwing up. A guard is holding his head in the garbage pail. And I think, geez, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. By the time I get to the room where I'm going to talk, six doors, six iron doors. I don't know if you've been in a prison before or gone to see that. I don't know if you've been behind six steel doors. And I'm not claustrophobic, I thought. But six steel doors. That's where these kids live. There were 12 boys, 12 guards. Six of them were from the medium security prison. Six of them had come from 49 miles away. They were from the maximum security prison. These boys were ages 11 to 13. 11 to 13. They had been in there for over a year at least. In that year, none of those boys, none of them, had seen anyone connection, connected to them biologically. No parent, no grandparent, no cousins, no one. No one. The only contact they had had with folks outside was from a church with adoptive grandparents who came on one night a week, the only time they were allowed. That's it. And I'm sitting there thinking, what can I say to these kids? What can I say to them? The librarian asked the first question, which character do you connect with in trouble? And I think, ah, oh, what a desperately awful question. This is going to be silence. No one will say anything. It will be awful. And this kid raises his hand, and he goes, Henry. And I say, Henry? And he goes, yeah, Henry, because he's athletic. Henry isn't athletic. But for this kid, he was. Another kid raises his hand, and he goes, black dog. In the book, the character black dog is you know, he's a dog. He's a dog. He's not a pirate. He's a dog. He's a lab. And I say, why? Why black dog? And he says, I've always wanted a dog, and I guess I'll never have one. I guess I'll never have one. And the third kid raises his hand, and he goes, Che. And I say, why? And he says, because whenever Che's father looks at him, he knows that this is the son that was born to his wife after she was raped and he hates him, like my dad. Well, it was a two hours to remember. I'll never forget it. At the end, this kiddo who had read the book, his name was Joseph, says to me, I want to write too. And I say, that's fantastic. What do you want to write about? And he says, I want to write about the planets. My favorite planet is Jupiter. And I said, Jake, uh, Joseph, that's fantastic. Can I send it to you, he says. Yeah, absolutely, send it to me. When I got back, I sent Joseph a poster of Jupiter and a book about the stars. They were confiscated because he was from that group that was not allowed to have anything in his cell. He's 12. 
At 4.30 in the afternoon, Joseph goes into his cell. There's a toilet in there, table, a bed. He's in there at 4.30. He will stay there until 6.30 the next morning when he will be released from the cell. He will work a little bit in a rather meaningless set of classes in a small common area until 4.30. This is a kid who wants to write about the stars in a room, who lives in a room where there are no windows. One last story. I go up to an Ojibwe school, also in northern Michigan. And when I get there, the teachers take me aside. I'm speaking to fifth graders. And they say, be careful with our kids, which seems to me like kind of beginning point. Of course I'm going to be careful with their kids. But they say, no, you don't understand. We've had more than the usual number of suicides this year, mostly fathers. More than the usual number of suicides. What's the usual number? So I go in and we do a writing exercise on characters. They're fantastic. These kids are writing, they're engaged, they're raising their hand, they're talking, they're showing what they've done. And there's a kiddo in the back, he's wearing a red shirt, and he's really quiet. And finally he raises his hand. And I go, go ahead, tell me. And he's about to read his stuff when every eye in the classroom turns to him. Everyone's looking at him. And instantly this kid, no kidding, hands like this, hands in front of his face. That's what he does. And he doesn't say anything. I say, we'll come back. Towards the end of that hour, I look at him and he's writing and I can see in him so much. And I finally call on him again. I say, tell me, tell me what you're writing. Bang, right away, hands in front of his face. He will not speak. At the end of the event, the teacher has brought in cream puffs. And there is nothing like cream puffs to bring fifth graders out of their seats to the front. And they all come up, except for this kid in the red shirt in the back. So I go back to him. And I said, kiddo, I think you have stories to tell. And I think he may have the skills to tell them. And he begins to tell me his story. He tells me the story of a father who's left behind a sword of power, but he's hidden it. And this kid who has to go find it, he has to find this sword of power. Because once he gets this sword of power, he can find the uglies, the uglies, and he can kill the uglies. And he'll take care of all the uglies. He'll do it all. And then, and then the first kid comes back, and the second kid, holding their cream puffs. And this kid, hands in front of his face. I'll see him next April. I'm pretty excited about that. But right then, his hands were in front of his face. Writing in America, especially for middle grade, it seems to me, I think a lot about those kids. What do I write that can perhaps give that young girl in Flint a voice when she doesn't have one? What can I write so that a kid in a prison, in a prison with no windows, can see Jupiter? What can I write so that a kid who has his hands in front of his face can begin to move those hands apart? What do I do to make that happen? How does it work? How does it work for all of you? So, here's how. And I give this to you as a challenge, and really perhaps to identify what it is that you guys in this room do. It comes from St. Augustine. I suspect that when you walked into the room today, you did not think you'd hear about St. Augustine, but that's fine. In a book called On Doctrine, he says, what does the writer do? What's it all about? What is a writer supposed to do? And he says, should the writer bring something beautiful into the world? Should you bring something of beauty into the world? And he goes, of course. Of course a writer must bring something which is beautiful into the world. Obvious. Then he says, should a writer bring knowledge and understanding into the world? Is that what a writer does? And he says, absolutely. Absolutely. A writer brings something of beauty and something of understanding into the world. Then he says, should a writer bring something of wisdom into the world? He says, yes, 
Absolutely. A writer should bring something of wisdom. A writer should bring beauty into the world, knowledge and understanding into the world, wisdom into the world. Absolutely. That's what you do. And then he says this. But if a writer begins with any of those three, that's where you start. If a writer begins with that, then the writer has it all wrong. The writer, says Augustine, begins with this. Does my writing serve? Does my writing serve? In this room, as you work on the books that you work on, as you make it possible that a book goes out into the world, that's what you're doing. You are serving. You are serving those, perhaps, who need them in ways that you cannot possibly imagine. You are sending them out into a world so that your readers can begin to move their hands away from their faces. That's what you do. And for that, folks, I honor you in words that I cannot even come up with. Thank you very much for letting me talk to you today.